Okay, so our next speaker is John Dean, who's a speech therapist. And uh, John is the uh, founder and director of the Parkinson's team uh, at Summit Rehab at Life Care Center of, Lo of Longmont. And that's also an interdisciplinary team like ours is at CNI. And um, so this program in 2012 was recognized as the first rehab center of excellence uh, for Parkinson's disease um, for the life care centers. So we'll give it away to John here to talk to us about the, the speech issues which include swallowing and um, as well as speech and cognitive issues too. All right. So I should probably do the same check. Can everyone hear me out there okay? At the back there too? Fabulous. Okay, um, so yes, I am John Dean and I am a speech language pathologist, which is a fancy term for speech therapist. And uh, we do have a network of Parkinson's programs around Colorado and we absolutely believe in the interdisciplinary model, and, and CNI has a great program for that. Uh, we think that seeing specialists that know what they're doing in a team format is always going to give you a better outcome. So there are going to be three primary areas that you're going to address with your speech therapist. Um, communication, which can be some of the voice and, and the speech, but also language, particularly with uh, the cortical basal syndrome or the CBD stuff. Uh, swallowing function, and particularly drooling is another issue that we, uh, we get into that. And then cognition, which is a really broad part of that. I mean, problem solving, memory, safety awareness, and then a kind of a catch-all term for executive function, which has to do with kind of planning. Uh, today, though, I'm really going to focus a lot on practical approaches. Um, looked Over the past couple of weeks, I looked on your website to see other presenters, and I always want to make sure everyone knows how great the content that you have on your website is. Between the how-to videos, and I looked at some of the other conferences from past years, and so there'll be better science in those presentations, particularly with Heidi and some of the other people that you did last year. Okay, so, um, and as you alluded to before, uh, rehabilitation approaches, they're, they're just not as effective for this population. We have more trouble sometimes um, getting the results we want, and when we do, it doesn't last as long, and uh, that means that we really like to see people as soon as we can. We will, earlier is better, we can get into the situation that we need to address much faster that way, and then you have an ongoing relationship. So you need to find uh, people that you like working with because you're going to have just a, a long-term relationship with them, okay, for, for rehab as well as your doctor as well as the other people on your team. Okay, oh, did I just do that? Okay, so yeah, for the speech and, and language issues, I'm just going to do a quick overview and I'm going to give you some simple techniques. Uh, obviously, the quiet speech and the quiet voicing, that's a real hallmark, and that's probably why this gets lumped into the, the Parkinsonisms and the other movement disorders. Although, as I was talking to someone out before we began, there's a lot of other features that don't seem to be shared by that. Uh, one of that is the slurred or the strained speech, and that's definitely not very Parkinsonistic, and it's something that alerts us to the fact that there could be something unusual going on. The difficulties with speech production, it could be stuttering, which we call disfluencies, but the, the doctors reference apraxia, which is a motor planning issue. And the way I try to describe that is people often know what they're trying to do uh, motorically. They're trying to produce a certain sound or start a certain movement, but they just can't seem to get the, the, uh, the, the, basically the signal to the right part of the body. And then another thing that's unusual about um, uh, atypical diagnoses is that it can progress with changes in language to aphasia, which is a real significant language problem finding proper words and actually seeking the words. Um, a number of people that I encounter that have Parkinson's do have typical word finding problems, but this is usually more serious. Okay, so what are we going to do? This is the simplest, basic, most ground level thing that I want you to do when you're trying to communicate with your partner. And you, you want to start with an environment that's well lit. Um, you want to avoid backlighting. I'm going to try to see if I can demonstrate that, but if you have a lot of, if you have a lot of light coming from behind you, it's difficult for people to see your face, and it's, it's very important that we can see your mouth. It, it's a big part of what we can do for recognition, particularly if there's any hearing loss involved. Um, so that's another part of this. You reduce, reduce all the noise you can in that environment. You might close doors, turn off the television, turn off the radio, and then I talk about visual distractions because sometimes if there's a lot of activity in the background. That can also be a little distracting. And then when you're getting ready to communicate, I want you to make sure that you make eye contact. That's a really, it's a base level communication intent. And so we, we make sure people know that we're getting ready to talk to them and you try to maintain that throughout the conversation. 
So if you're the person with the disease process going on, you want to begin each sentence with as much air as you can. Without enough air, you're never going to be able to increase the volume enough, so you really want to get a full breath of air and use all that air as you're speaking. If you have a, a breakdown in communication, I want you to be sure that you just rephrase the part you're having trouble with. So if you're, if you're getting to a point in the sentence and it's like, that's the trouble area, just rephrase that part. Don't have to go through the whole part of it again. And then I like a lot of body uh, language, a lot of gestures, and it's a good way of not just making context, but also to say, hey, I'm still talking, or I, I got one more thing I want to say, and it's very common to do that, so it's, it should be pretty intuitive. If you're a care partner, or you're encountering someone who has one of these diseases, then I want you to be sure that um, you're trying to make it as easy for them to communicate as possible. So you close open-ended sentences whenever you can, and you might say something like, for example, when we have lunch in a little bit, do you want a grilled cheese or do you want pasta? And if you're having trouble with what they're, they're saying, you can't understand it, you just ask for clarification of the misunderstood part, and you, you make it very simple. And if you get to a point where you can't get that out, then you work it into yes and no questions. And that's kind of the hierarchy we try to follow. OK, another simple solution that we like to use is an amplifier. And it's a personal amplifier. That, that one, I have one on my table over there, is just about this big. And um, I put a number of manufacturers on there. I am using this one right now. This, where's the laser? There it is. I'm using this one right now just because it was a speech therapist who came up with it, so I'm biased. But they're all good. You know, it's all a matter of something to give you a little more volume. Though, again, if you have somebody that's having a lot of issues with the production of the speech, it might not be that beneficial only because you're going to be amplifying a signal that's not working very well. I do like an amplified telephone, and I used to have a big list, but I tried to cut this down. I already have too many slides, and I might blow through some of them just to get to our timing. So just look on, online for an amplified telephone. I believe PAR actually has a, uh, an equipment closet that will let you borrow stuff. So if you go to the Parkinson's Association of the Rockies, they can help you find that. People outside of your own, outside of Colorado can look for their own people in their own state. Now, interestingly, I've seen a couple of iPad and iPhone versions of this device, and I've, I've wanted to build one for a while, but the problem is that they, they require an external microphone and an external speaker, and that's not nearly as uh, convenient as it should be. So if, uh, if you have that and you want to put a speaker out, it should be a substitute for this thing up here. Okay, for more complicated stuff, um, you could get into what we call augmentative and alternative communication. And I really, it's not my first choice. Um, I find that uh, I really want to reinforce verbal communication as long as possible. And another issue is by the time this becomes a real issue and we need to implement that, there's other issues uh, with a progressive supranuclear palsy. The vision could be a real factor, and there could be some movement issues that could make it not very feasible. And again, I was talking with this person who, uh, coming in from Canada, and that's exactly their experiences. A little too complicated later on. A viable alternative that I use quite frequently in our facility is I'll just use a communication board, which will be a piece of paper that I've developed, and it has some custom phrases on the top, and then you flip it over, and there's an alphabet board, and that allows us to really, um, you know, just identify context or say simple things, and it supplements the speech, so you're continuing to communicate. You're not going to get rid of the communication, but you're making it a little easier. Okay, and there are some of those devices on the iPad, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to kind of move past that. But the devices that are dedicated are very expensive, so this might be a viable alternative if you're dealing with a funding situation. And then I just, I just saw this. I've, I've been aware of it for a while. This is actually a device where they put something in your ear, and then they put a little sensor, an accelerometer, on your throat. And when it senses that you're speaking, it increases the volume of a sound in your ear, and it makes you talk loud. It uses something we call the Lombard effect. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, again, not my first choice. I have used it a couple times. And I was at that World Parkinson's conference just a couple weeks ago, and I got to see it in, in action. OK, I'm, I'm going to get into the swallowing stuff here a little bit. This is a big deal. Uh, in, in all three of the major diagnoses of the PSP and the MSA and the CBD, swallowing problems are a very big factor in, in what I do. And it's a big problem, and we want to address it early. So I'm going to keep it real simple here. Again, there's better science out there on other presentations. But basically, the definition of a swallowing dysfunction, which they call dysphagia, is going to be abnormal movement of food or liquid, which they're going to call the bolus, from the mouth to the stomach. Okay? And it's, they say due to abnormalities in the structures or 
in their movements. And for us, it's usually the movements. The structures are intact. They're just not moving the way they were, whether it's the patterning, the sequencing, or the amount of effort, okay? And there are three areas that we're focused on. In the mouth, the oral part here, and that's when you're chewing it up and we have the back of our tongue kind of staying up to keep food from getting back into the airway before we're ready to swallow. Um, then you have the pharyngeal area here, which includes a, a kind of a common passageway that could be the airway in the front or the food passageway in the back, and obviously we don't want it to be the airway in the front. So this little flap of skin will come down and cover it up and the food will go from here into the esophagus, and then you get to the last phase, the esophageal phase. I do want to hit one other thing here. Something that's very important and that we're always trying to avoid is have anything from the mouth get into here and then eventually get down into the lungs. That could cause uh, something that we call aspiration pneumonia. And aspiration pneumonia means that you've had a food particle that probably has some bacteria on it getting into the airway and eventually getting into basically a dark, moist place in the body. And that's trouble because food will have some protein in it, it might have some sugar, it'll have bacteria on it, and now you put it into an environment that's very hospitable to growing something, and that'll eventually turn into a pneumonia. And it's, it's a very serious issue. Okay, so when I'm out and I'm working with somebody, I become concerned when they're telling me maybe I'm avoiding certain foods because it's too much trouble, or you've had an episode that scared you and you're never going to eat a certain food again. Or if it's taking you a long time to eat, that's a big issue for me because I could include losing weight, but it probably means that you're having issues. And then if you're coughing more, particularly at mealtimes and especially on liquids. Um, liquids have a tendency to go wherever they want to go, and that means that as you're chewing something, a little bit of liquid could go right down in the back of your throat and get into the airway, and that's a big issue. As a matter of fact, probably the worst thing you could do would be to combine a liquid with a solid piece of food. So like a soup that has soup plus the vegetables or cold cereal or the one that we all do, and I want to try to talk you out of that right now, is taking your pills with water. That's, that's a very difficult mixed consistency is what they call that. And it's much easier if you were to put them into some yogurt or some applesauce or some pudding and that suspension will take it down much safer, much easier and without the, the consequences I'm talking about. And this last thing here I want to talk about is if you are starting to drool, and it's much more common, again, in people with, uh, with atypical diagnoses, there's definitely research that says that there's a risk for increased risk for um, pneumonia and aspiration, and it's, it's an indication that we could have some trouble. Part of it has to do with the way the body's reacting, but part of it, you just have more saliva that could potentially transport something from your mouth into your, into your airway. So at mealtime, there's a lot of ways to compensate, and I think your OT is, is probably where you start by addressing the equipment side, but I'm gonna go back again and start talking about the environment, the distracting environment. If I'm in an, a, a facility and we're having trouble, um, I first put someone in a place where it's a little quieter and there's not people moving around in front of them. We might do something where we have small bites and small sip sizes, and that helps often. And if you're at home, sometimes you, you encounter uh, somebody might be a little impulsive, particularly with PSP, but with, with any diagnosis. And if that's the case, you might actually regulate how much food you put on the plate. You might have a whole meal, but you might only put a couple bites out or a bite at a time. And that's a way to kind of make people slow down uh, naturally without having to be too, too aggressive about it. Um, the the prevail, prevail cups down here also can kind of tighter how much liquid's coming out. So you'll take a sip and it'll pull out 30 cc's or, or whatever it is that you want it to be, probably less than that, maybe 10. Um, I like shorter, more frequent meals. They're less fatiguing, you can get through with that, and if you can time it, if you are reacting to your medication, if you can time it with the times that your medication is working well, that's even better. And sometimes we'll alternate between solid and liquid, and what that'll do is it'll clear out any residue. Just like you have the quiet voicing and the quiet speech, all the muscles inside uh, for swallowing are also not firing with as much energy. And that's a big issue because you'll get some residues in places that you normally would clear out when you're swallowing. And so that's a nice way to help that. Okay, if you go to a speech therapist and they do one of those modified tests, modified barium swallow studies that the doctor was talking about, or you can do a fees with a camera, um, they might come back and say, we see this problem, we think you should modify your diet. And modifying your diet simply means chopping up food and thickening liquids. And you might avoid certain foods altogether, especially ones that have a really thick texture like a steak or a pork chop, 
or things that scatter or spread out in the, in, in the throat when you're swallowing them, like popcorn and rice. I'd like to add to that anything that's stringy, anything like an asparagus or celery that's got strings that maybe are not going to be um, able to separate uh, adequately when you're swallowing. So uh, at a facility, typically they'll chop it up in a very uniform way. We use a very uh, consistent guideline from the dietitian, and that's fine in that environment for a short term. But if you're at home, I'm not going to encourage you to take something that you really like and then start pureeing it. So don't take your favorite food and turn it into a pate unless that's really what you're shooting for. There are a lot of better things out there that you could eat that are soft naturally, and you don't have to do uh, anything particularly aggressive to get them to there. So the mashed potatoes taste great. The beans, especially refried beans. And I use a lot of cottage cheese and applesauce. And sometimes I might even supplement that if I want to get more protein in there. I like using a slow cooker to prepare foods because a slow cooker automatically adds a lot of moisture and softens things. And um, you know, stews and thick soups, that's good. If you've got something with vegetables in it, I probably want you to blend it a little bit before you start serving it so that it's all one consistency. I don't want a, something where you've got a carrot with some liquid in there at the same time. I've used it with pasta, believe it or not, and it visually not sta stellar, it's not dazzling you, but it has the same flavor, it's very soft, and it's a nice way to maybe get, like if you like lasagna, that'd be a great way to do it, and it would taste great, it just wouldn't look wonderful, I wouldn't take a picture of it for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the meat's the same situation, if you're going to eat a meat, uh, I've done a roast chicken in there, something like that, and that's very soft and a lot of moisture. You want to serve with gravy or sauces or condiments because you want to add that extra liquid and you want to smooth the transition from your mouth into your esophagus. And anytime you can add a little bit of gravy or sauce, that's going to help it a little bit. Um, steaming, boiling, a blender, these are all other ways to make food softer and help that out a little bit. Um, and I'll say the last thing for this part is I just go on to Amazon or the PAR has a good library or if you want to go to your local library and look for a dysphagia diet or an easy chew cookbook or something like that. Okay, for thickening liquids, there are some commercial thickener options, and basically it's modified cornstarch, or there's something that uses like a xanthan gum or something like that to do it if you're diabetic. And I always seek out naturally thickened liquids first. So apricot nectar, tomato juice are great, great starts. Ice cream, unfortunately, is not a thickened liquid. Everyone will ask me that, but there is, <laughs> there is a magic cup out there. If you really need to have ice cream, Hormel makes a product that you can buy. Um, I use alternatives to commercial thickener like potato flakes and tapioca and banana flakes. And uh, Laura per Purcell Verdun was talking about tofu. I thought that's a great idea to add some protein while you're thickening. If you're going to thicken a liquid, I'm going to tell you juices taste pretty good. Okay? Water, not as much because it's a little bitter because of the cornstarch. Uh, milk, same situation. Hot chocolate, if you have someone that's not really on board for thickening liquid, hot chocolate is magic. I, I, if I could just package it the right way, I'm sure I could sell it on the open market. It tastes great. So it'd be one if you have someone who's not really dying to do this, that might be a great place to start. Okay, and the OT talked a little about oral care, so I'm going to kind of move on because I don't want to run out of time. I want to have time for questions here. One thing you might consider in the later stages is getting a, a suctioning machine, you know, and there's actually a toothbrush that you can attach to that so you can get suction to clear out some of the, the materials after a meal and it can help a little bit. Again, this is covered quite a bit. Artificial nutrition or a, or a peg tube could be an option. There's a lot of questions about that and it's not necessarily going to reduce aspiration, but that's a question to have with your doctor fast, early, and have it often because you might change your mind about it. Okay, again, I want to, I want to kind of get through to the last part so I don't I don't go into too much of this. Respiratory function is a big issue, obviously, and it has to do a little bit with the posture and maybe some of the rigidity and some fatigue and obstruction, particularly with MSA if you have what we call a laryngeal stridor where the vocal folds are coming together and you're, and you're basically getting sound on the inhale. Okay, and so you can do some training for that. You can use uh, some, can, I, have a, I brought one of the devices. I was showing it to their speech therapist at CNI about it. Um, you can do some work with something like that. You can do some stuff with cocktail straws or the breather, or she mentioned a balloon. You can do anything to do to, to basically strengthen the breath, and that's going to result in a better upright posture. There's some research out of uh, Florida that shows that it's improving swallow function. Um, that's for idiopathic Parkinson's, but I, I think it fits. And, and there's a lot of reasons why you want to do that. Okay, for, for drooling, I'm going to keep this quick because the doctor talked about it. 
Um, he mentioned that um, ice chips and hard candies and mints, and I'll just say as an ap apropos of nothing, cinnamon would be a better choice. Anything that has a mint in it, spearmint or, or peppermint, actually relaxes uh, the uh, sphincters and could actually increase reflux. So you don't necessarily want to use those, especially if you're using them a lot. He mentioned that the medications are quite difficult because uh, they have cognitive effects, except for the glycopyrrolate, which doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Again, this is kind of doctor stuff, so I'm going to move on just to get, get into the last pieces here. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. He also mentioned a little Botox, and I really like that. They usually put it in the parotid glands, which are right along the side here. There is some research out of the Netherlands talking about using it on the uh, submandibular. Um, I'm, I'm not on board for that yet, but maybe, maybe she'll publish some more on that. There are more aggressive ways to deal with the drooling. I think that what the doctor said is right, that if you do some Botox and you do it every three or four months, it's a nice way to probably um, take care of it and it's not permanent. So if you don't like that sensation, if you have too much dry mouth, well, you haven't done anything permanent where if you do something with surgery or radiation, you have done something that's not changeable. Okay, and I just wanna keep this really quick because again, I, I, everything's modify your environment. That could be my motto. It's like, hi, modify your environment, modify your environment. But start out with your layout. Start with your lighting and get rid of anything that's distracting, okay? Uh, I use a lot of lists, a lot of signage. I, I should have brought them with me, but I have a little like plastic sheets that are like portable whiteboards and they fit on the wall with static and I can write stuff on there. And it's really common uh, da daily stuff or something that's new. And you wanna use those as much as possible there is a lot of technology out there, and it just depends on your comfort level with that, whether you're gonna to wanna to do that. But pill reminders, PAR actually has a pill reminding app called PD Life, and there's digital versions. Um, I, I got this idea actually from Ruth Fletcher Carter, um, uh, Car Carter Fletcher, um, from the Loveland Support Group that, um, sorry, I do that every time too. She was talking about a really great idea where her husband um, was eating very slowly, and so she would take that time to read from the newspaper, and it was an opportunity for him to do what he needed to do to get his meal. She would keep him informed and they would connect, and I love that. I think that's a great story and it's a great idea. And taking that to the next step, I think that there's some interesting ideas with um, uh, online radio, either for the blind, there's a Colorado talking book library, the audio information network will actually read newspapers and periodicals, and then you can go to the traditional sources and get books or something like that, but particularly with people who are having visual deficits due to progressive supernuclear palsy, I think that's a great way to go around that. And if, again, if you have the time, uh, reading the paper together sounds like a lot of fun. So, okay, I think that's about it here, yeah. My summary is start by finding your team. Again, Colorado Neurologic Institute has been around for years and they have a fabulous reputation and they have a great team model. Um, our teams are located further out, so if you're in an outlying area, we might be an opp opportunity if you need to get some treatment but you still need to have a relationship with, with the hospital and uh, a top level neurologist. If you have an atypical diagnosis of, of Parkinson's, I really think you should have a movement disorder specialist at the helm. Uh, you're gonna need to get in the habit of some consistent daily exercise. That's important, uh, it's gonna help a lot, and you wanna start experimenting with a lot of different ideas because you're gonna find something that works for you, and it might only work for a couple months or it might work for a year, and then you're gonna need the next one, and so you need to be willing to try stuff and experiment and keep looking for information. Okay, and uh, that's my contact information, anyone has any questions, but of course I'll be around, and I have toys at my, my booth too, so. <laughs>